Hi, welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. In this video, we are dealing with a question and answer. Now, usually on Sunday mornings, we're going through the book of Acts, right? Well, we're taking a little bit of a break from that now because um, I need this slot to answer a question. <laughs> I, get, I get a lot of questions. I actually have a backlog of questions right now. There's about six or seven that I want to do videos on. Um, and uh, if you want a question answered on a video or just an email reply, uh, shoot me an email. If I do a video of it, I will not include your name. If you write a question in a public comment somewhere, like under a YouTube video, I might have a screenshot that includes your name. But if you send me an email, it's all anonymous. You don't have to worry about it. I will not say your name. As a matter of fact, well, yeah, I just won't say your name. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, we, we get a lot of questions... Uh, and this one's about regeneration and being born again, so we're going to address that and put it up here on the screen in a second. I do want to remind you that uh, if you want to support this channel, you can do so. The, the details to do so are in the description below. Um, all of what we do is brought to you by people like you who want to see content like this continue and want to see it continue ad-free. So if you would like to see that, uh, we invite you to support the channel. For everyone who supports the channel in December, we are running a special. We are uh, giving away 12 free months of indulgences for everyone who supports during the month of September, uh, December. Yeah, December. So that is 12 extra months you won't have to spend in purgatory. And we're doing a buy one, get one free. So you can also do it for a family member as well if you support during the month of December. So you want to make sure you don't miss that. And uh, the details to support are in the description below. Our question that we have is about being born again and regeneration. And the question is, is being born of God and born again in John 1.13 and John 3, pointing forward to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit at the beginning of Pentecost, what does that mean for Abraham? If so, what does it, uh, what does it mean what does is mean? It's a probably a typo. What does it mean for any, for anyone prior to this if they must be born again to enter the kingdom of God? Abraham, following on from this, in one thirteen, I think they mean John one thirteen, is children of God and born of God synonymous here, or does it represent the progression prior to Pentecost specifically? Believers became children of God who were then born of God from Pentecost forward. So, this is a great question. The reason it's a great question is because there are a lot of terms here that we sometimes equivocate. Most of the time, when you hear the phrase children of God versus born of God uh, versus born again, most people will conflate all of those things together. Using the, and, and they will also conflate it with inductive method. So, uh, not inductive method. They also conflate it with regeneration, which is why we use the inductive method to call our attention to the fact that these things are different. And one of the principles of interpretation is very, very simple. It's that things different are not the same. So if I see born of God and born again, following the inductive method, I should treat it as if it's separate or plausibly separate until I get confirmation otherwise, because they are two different words, they sound different, they're spelled different, and they have different definitions. And it's interesting how much I have to say that phrase when I'm dealing with people like Calvinists. Now, I know that this, this question is not particularly about Calvinism, but we are going to cross over and deal with Calvinism for a bit. And the reason we're going to do that is because Calvinism has been around for centuries, and it affects our thinking in ways that we don't realize. We have thoughts about regeneration and being born again that even though we're not Calvinists, we still inadvertently borrow from Calvinists because we hear the things repeated so often and we don't realize that we never actually got it from Scripture, but we just heard it from Brother Melms so often that we think it is Scripture, but it really maybe isn't at all, okay? So we promote first principles thinking on this channel. So when it comes to everything, and I don't care how fundamental you think it is, when it comes to everything, we're going to go all the way down to the lowest level of sense making where we can start with 
and build our way up from there. And we're going to go back to our minimalist axioms. What are our basic axioms that result in a Christian worldview? And they're simple. It's uh, that God exists. God is true. The Bible comes from God. Therefore, the Bible is true. It's, it's that simple. Everything else from there that you believe, whatever it is, if it's true with respect to Christianity, it is a derivative of those axioms. So some people, well, I think it's axiomatic that, you know, Jesus is the son of God. No, the, no, that's not one of the axioms. The axiom is that the Bible is true and the Bible tells us that Jesus is the son of God. If you interpret it correctly, that would be, that would be how that would follow. So it could be a fundamental truth, but it is not a starting point axiom, okay? It's something that is a derivative by following where the axioms lead us if we assume those are true. Now, of course, when you're conducting sense making, ultimately, you would have to question those axioms too. You would have to. But for the sake of presuming that the Christian worldview is true, those are the axioms that you would have to have. Maybe you wouldn't even have to have those, but for the sake of simplicity, we're not going to delve into that in this video, but we need to. We do need to. <clears throat> so we always want to be conducting sense making. Let's see if we can spot some presuppositions in, in this question, okay? And I'm not being critical of the question asker, okay? The question Asker is asking good questions or being inquisitive, okay? So when I when I spot presuppositions, I'm, I just had presuppositions, my own presuppositions pointed out to me this week, okay? So this is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. So we help each other identify our presuppositions and eliminate them and then conduct better sense making from there forward. So <clears throat> is being born of God and born again in John 1, 13 and John 3 pointing forward? Okay, noticed, uh, are they assuming these are the same? I don't know. And John 3, pointing forward to the indwelling of the Spirit of the Holy Spirit being at Pentecost. Okay. The Holy Spirit does come at Pentecost. Does the indwelling of the Holy Spirit start at Pentecost? I, there's a lot of good reasons to believe it does, but you would have to mark that down as an assumption that needs to be validated. Okay. If you're doing like uh, military decision making <laughs> process, MDMP. Whenever there's, you would have to identify statements like this. And if you cannot think of a passage right away that ties the indwelling to Pentecost, you need to mark that down as an assumption, okay? Now, we are probably going to proceed with that assumption, but we need to know that it's an assumption as we do. Tracking? So we're not, we're not taking it as a hard, cold fact. But, yeah. So what does that mean for Abraham. If so, what does it mean for anyone prior to this if they must be born again to enter the kingdom? Example, Abraham. So we're going to deal with all of that as we go forward. But I also want to say that I, I'm, I'm trying to dial back on presenting this channel or myself or any ministry as having explanatory power that can't. Because, you know, the whole issue of we crave certainty and craving certainty, having forget what the wisdom gym is called, like the Lyceum or something like that. Having certainty craving, having your certainty craving scratched or itched or satisfied takes you out of the wisdom gym, okay? And these things need to be wrestled with. And so I don't want to use that as a cop-out to not try to answer the question, but at the same time, what I'm going to do as I answer the question is I'm going to try to present you with more information so that you can wrestle with these concepts in a more informed way. But I do not want you to mistake what I'm saying as trying to convey to you absolute, certified, epistemically sound, 100% confidence margin truth. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to give you more things to think about as you struggle with this thing, as you conduct your own sense making. Could be that I say something in this video which is completely wrong, but makes you think of something else, which helps me correct my thinking, okay? So there's a back and forth on this kind of thing. And I, so what I'm trying to do is be, have a provocation or an incitement to think or to act or to be in that wisdom gym, some more, maybe some more information to conduct the struggle with rather than try to provide 
absolute certainty for you, which isn't really what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to provide absolute certainty to anybody. I'm trying to help equip people for the struggle. Now, if you're interested, since there are so many slides here and since it could be so informative, I am going to put this slide deck in Etsy and I'm going to put, there's going to be a link. There is a link by the time you watch this. There is a link in the description below this video if you want to buy this slideshow. So you can use it for your own purposes. Do whatever you want to with it. You can edit it. You can delete it. You can present it um, at your home, at your church, online, call it your own. Whatever you want to do with it, it'll be available on Etsy in PowerPoint format that you can easily edit and do whatever you want to with it. So I'll put that out there for you if that will help to make this available. So <laughs> let's look at some mistaken thinking that I think needs to be pointed out right away. Let me get rid of this thing. There we go. The mistaken thinking that we get from Calvinism is that regeneration is a necessary condition for anyone to be saved at any point in history. And the reason for that is because they, Calvinism has a lot of technical debt. That Calvinism is a cascade of thoughts that stem from Augustine's view of the will, which he borrowed from Pelagius and then flipped on its head. So it's built on the Pelagian premise of the will flipped on its head. So if there's anything that's semi-Pelagian, it's, it's Calvinism more than anything else. Okay, We don't start with any presumption of the human will. We start with scriptural authority and only scriptural authority. We actually don't care what it says about the will. We just treat it as true. Okay, Calvinism, like Pelagianism, starts with a presumption of the human will. We do not do that. Now, since they ha are a cascade of doctrines that stem from that, they have to have regeneration preceding faith. That could fly as plausible, maybe, in the New Testament. Now, there's no scripture for it in the New Testament, but in the situation where regeneration is happening, that could fly. But what they don't realize as they're creating, here's some of the technical debt, is um, things they put into place without realizing it's creating problems elsewhere because it hasn't been thoroughly thought through. Remember, Augustine was fairly young, <laughs> Uh, you know, the lifespans weren't that long back then. And then Calvin wrote his institutes when he was 26. So these are a bunch of clowns that don't know what they're talking about. Okay. And what they did not do is think about the Old Testament. There's no regeneration. There's no reason using the inductive method to presume that regeneration is occurring in the Old Testament. Calvinism needs it to occur. They need salvation to occur the same way all the time throughout all history. Problem is it doesn't do that. Okay. Regeneration is not part of salvation in the Old Testament. I'll point you to some more resources to dig deeper into that concept later. But what we observe in the inductive method, the inductive method observation view. And by the way, when it comes to labels, people say, what are you? Are you a provisionist or a traditionalist or an Arminian or a Pelagian? Um, the only label that I would let somebody call me, and I know it's, you know, people are, well, I'm a biblicist or a Jesusist. That's kind of pretentious, you know? So I would go with, I'm an inductive method practitioner. That's that's the only label I would let somebody call me if you need to have a label for somebody. Okay. So the inductive method observation view would be that regeneration is merely a benefit. Here's what I have observed anyway, using the inductive method. Regeneration is a benefit. It's a fringe benefit. It's an accessory of salvation of in the current era right now. In other words, between Pentecost Acts 2 and the Harpazo, 1 Thessalonians 4.17, the catching away, between those two events... Regeneration seems to be a phenomenon during this time period in which we find ourselves. And it's a, what somebody might call narcissism to take something that you think applies to you and then try to apply it ever else in scripture. And that's a problem with that's a problem with Christianity. That's a problem, yeah, with Christians in general. We find something to be true and then we try to make it true everywhere. And that's one of the problems with like for example, the doctrine of eternal security. That that would only also apply between Acts 2 and, <laughs> and the Harpazo, the catching away of 1 Thessalonians 4.17. Not before that and not after that for lots of scriptural reasons. And so when people think that that's true, then they try to go make the Old Testament teach it. They go to Ezekiel, they go to Psalm 51, they, they go to all kinds of places to try to make the Old Testament teach eternal security. Well, it doesn't because there isn't any in the Old Testament. It doesn't start till Acts 2. It's not a thing. If it's even there, okay? <laughs> so if, if it's even there, the sealing of the Spirit on which that doctrine should be based if you're not a Calvinist. 
doesn't even happen, start until Acts 2. So you don't want to anachronistically take something that, a finding that you believe to be true and try to make it true everywhere because it might not be. Um, Daniel's 70th week, which either the whole thing or half of it may be coming soon to a city near you, um, it may not even be in effect during that time period. Okay, So those are things to think about. That's the inductive method observation. Now, Calvinism needs regeneration to be happening because of the doctrine that stems from Augustinian's false Pelagian premises. We don't need that. Bible believers don't need regeneration to be happening to Abraham or David or anybody else. So when it comes to sons of God, back in the question, we have born again, born of God, and we have uh, children of God here, okay? So this concept of the children of God, uh, something else you want to bear in mind, there are at least, let me make this a little bolder. Maybe you can read this better. There are at least six different ways that children or sons of God is expressed in Scripture. Number one, Adam is called a son of God in Luke 3.38. Number two, Israel is referred to as a son of God in Hosea 11.1. 1. Three, angelic beings who witnessed creation were referred to as sons of God in Job 38, 4 and 7. Well, Job 38, 7. And these are probably the same sons of God, probably, same probably, same assumption, that are in Job 1 and 2 and Genesis 6. Okay, um, Probably some kind of angelic beings who were there and witnessed creation. Number four, all of humanity is referred to as the offspring of God in Acts 17, 29 by Paul. Number five, Jesus is referred to as the only begotten Son of God. Well, I should probably write that in there. Um, and why the word begotten? Some Bibles will say one and only Son of God. Well, that would make that verse a lie because there are at least five other kinds of sons of God. Maybe more that I haven't found. But there are at least five other kinds of sons of God. So that's why it's important that that verse specifies only begotten Son of God. He's the only person that came into the world begotten already as a son of God um, in the sense that we think of it. And then you have current era believers like today, you and I, if you become a Christian, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life, beloved, now are we the sons of God? First John 3, 2, Romans 8, 19, and lots of places where we're referred to as children, sons of God, that sort of thing. Okay. So you become a son of God by the new birth. Adoption is not, we'll talk, we have lots of videos on adoption, so do not confuse adoption with sonship. Um, it's, adoption is epiphenomenal to and derivative from sonship. It is not fundamental to it, and that's important to understand. So there are at least six different kinds of sons of God in the Bible. You need to understand that. So look at the context whenever the phrase shows up and see what are we dealing with here, okay? And you may find you may find a seventh or an eighth kind or something like that. And remember, always look to the context to see what it's talking about. You don't, I, I am steering away from making a doctrine out of words and phrases and then try to put that doctrine everywhere the word and phrase shows up because that's bad practice for a lot of reasons. We have 1 John 1, 12, and 13, which is also mentioned by our questioner. Which were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Okay, so being born of God, right? Now, I know this is used by Calvinists as a proof text. We have a video, why John 1, 13 does not support Calvinism. Go check that out when you get a chance. We've addressed that in many videos. Basically, receiving Jesus Christ in John 1, 12 is a prerequisite in order for God, uh, in order to be born again by God. So yeah, you're born again by the will of God, but after you receive Jesus Christ, just like the text says. Okay, so go watch that video if you want to see more on that. So is this the same, born of God, and then is that the same as born again in John chapter 3? In John chapter 3, John, Jesus and Nicodemus are talking. Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. Very interesting. We know that thou art a teacher from God, for no one can do these miracles except God be with him. And Jesus said, Verily I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now our questioner says, enter the kingdom of God. Enter the kingdom of God. The text says, see the kingdom of God. Are those two the same? Maybe, maybe not. Mark it down as an assumption that needs to be validated. Okay? Maybe they're the same. Maybe they're not. Um, the Calvinists try to take this passage and try to say that you 
as a Christian today, if you're genuinely regenerated, you can perceive the kingdom of God. I don't think that's what it's talking about. I think, and I have videos on this one too. I don't have the, for whatever reason, I don't have the uh, the placard for it here to remind you. But I do also have videos on John 3, 3, 3 through 8, stuff like that. Um, right around the same time frame that this other one came out. So, <laughs> Except a man be born again. You're born again now. Later in the future after you die. When you are. B- b- it does not now appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear. We shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And all of creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. So we're sons of God now. Romans eight nineteen. We're sons of God now. But not manifested as such. There will be things that we see in our glorified body. Kingdom of God is spiritual. We are physical. Kingdom of heaven is a physical, literal, physical, political kingdom on earth. They're not, they're not the same thing. So the kingdom of God is a spiritual thing. When you are, when you are glorified, you will actually see it. So see him as, it, as he is. Um, and right now, you need to be born again now so that you can see it then. Okay? And um, I don't take this as something that you have to you perceive now. Okay? That's... that's when the Calvinists think that way, it's basically Gnosticism. The way Gnosticism works, this uh, supernaturally imbued osmosis type power that only comes to a certain few elect people. That all comes from Manichaean Gnosticism. And they import that kind of thinking into passages like this rather than believing what the text says. So except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then he says, well, how can somebody be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? I understand that there are cartoons where that can happen, but I uh, don't recommend them. And Jesus answered, Verily I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Back to the questioner. She says, he, she, whatever this is, enter the kingdom of God. Now we have the phrase enter. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God, which is interesting because later on, I think it's in Acts 14, Paul says, through much tribulation, we must enter into the kingdom of God. That's very strange, okay? So, and then Jesus Christ says uh, in Luke, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, that's strange. Strange. And be born again. And then in Colossians, Paul says he has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So you um, apparently being born again, are you are you put into the kingdom right then, and then you see it later, or is this talking about a perception and entry? Are these the same thing? Are they different? That kind of thing. These are things that need to be sorted out. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Now I understand when it comes to these things, it's a lot easier to conflate these things and make them the same. It makes the problem go away. You have the certainty, and you no longer have the itch to find the find the issue. We're not going to let you get off that easy. So the born of water is obvious. It's not, you know, the water dogs running around. They see every time they see water, they see baptism. Every time they see baptism, they see water. Well, the born of water is explained over here as being born of flesh. Like when a woman's water breaks, okay? And that which is born of spirit is spirit. So no, you don't have to enter into the mother's womb again to be born. Uh, marvel not that you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth. Thou canst not hear the sound thereof, but thou canst not tell, but thou canst not tell what... Whence it cometh and whither it goeth, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Again, the Calvinists think that this is everyone that is being born of the Spirit, but this is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Um, in other words, it's not going to be, you're not going to be able to say, well, all the people who are born of the Spirit all, all emanate right from Rome, Italy. <laughs> it's not like that. Or they all are following John Calvin. No. It's, it surprises you, the people that are born of the Spirit, where they come from and what their backgrounds are. Nicodemus answered and said to them, How can these things be? And Jesus said, Art thou master of Israel and knoweth not these things? Now this phrase right here um, <laughs> is a clue that most people understand that this would mean that there should be something about this in the Old Testament. If, if being a master of Israel implies that this is something that you should know, then that would imply that it's something you could read about in the Old Testament. Okay? So we'll talk more about that. Um, the Calvinists are going to take you to Ezekiel 36 on that. 
and they're going to create more problems for themselves because that is future tense. <laughs> and it's about Israel. It's not about people getting saved. It's not about Gentiles getting saved in church in 2021. It's, a, it's about Israel, specifically. Ezekiel 36 is. So we're going to look at that in just a minute too. So just because Jesus says something does not necessarily mean that it's active at the time that he says it. That's something that you need to know. So just because Jesus, like back here in John 3, he's saying, hey, you got to be born again. I have John 3 over in the left-hand side of your screen. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Art thou a master of Israel and you don't know this, right? So that would that might lead a person to think that being born again is something that can happen right there at that exact moment, okay? Well, is it? I don't know. Let's look at something Jesus says in John seven thirty seven. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. If you were to stop the text right there, you might think that a person right there at that feast could believe on Jesus and then that would happen. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, whatever that means, right? But the very next verse gives us a clue that that doesn't happen right then. He's telling something of the future. Verse 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. Future tense. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, for that Jesus was not yet glorified. So none of this, Jesus is saying it here, but none of it is going to happen until after Jesus is glorified, which is after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, okay? So um, that sets a precedent that just because Jesus is saying something at a particular time doesn't mean that it is immediately effective, actively effective. It could be referring to something that comes out later as a truth. Now, the writer of the book of John knows this. He's got probably all the writings of Paul on the table in front of him by the time he's writing, because he's writing in like maybe 80 AD or so, right? And so he's got a lot of, a lot of the things that he's learned since this happened, he's putting back into the text. That's why this is in parentheses. Huh. I happen to know now having spoken to Jesus afterward and the resurrected Jesus and da, da 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 that what he really meant was this, okay? So there we have an example of that happening. So just because you see being born again, being spoken of by Jesus does not necessarily mean that a person could be born again at that moment. It could be like this. He that believeth on me as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow river of living water, but he spake this of the spirit. Now later we're going to see Titus 3, 5 where regeneration happens by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Well, if if regeneration and being born again are the same thing, if they are, and it happens by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not yet given at this time, then being born again and regeneration does not happen until the Spirit is given either. Okay? So that would be the logical following on that. Now, when it comes to this issue, I do already have a video, which you might want to watch, called Regeneration in the Old Testament. Or a Calvinist problem, there's no Old Testament regeneration, is the title of the video if you search for it online. And then the thumbnail looks like this. Regeneration of the Old Testament, Calvinism's glaring oversight. Okay, It's not there. I also have a video which delves into some of these things called 35 Truths That Destroy Calvinism. Now, really, they're just 35 findings. I have to say things like destroy Calvinism to get views because this is a YouTube channel and people like controversial things. And if I don't put something controversial in the title, it doesn't get views, even though I think it contains very necessary information that a Christian needs to know or be exposed to. So sometimes I'll have to put, <laughs> I feel like anyway, I feel pressured because it's YouTube to put kind of a controversial spin on things for the sake of increasing views so that more people can be exposed. Not for the sake of me and the channel getting views, but I'm trying to, I have information that I think is worthwhile and I want as many people as possible to be exposed to it. So, you know, constantly trying to work the Rubik's Cube on how to do that. Uh, and we're not hiring 20 year olds to try on lingerie because, you know, we would get 2.2 million views a week doing that, but that's not what our channel is about. Also, you need to see more information on this 
we have the eight A's of salvation. This is a playlist. And the eight A's of salvation are appropriation, application, accession, accessories, assembly, afterlife, amount of revelation, and action. Now, what we're talking about today would go in the accessories, part four. The accessories part. What do you? What does a believer get? And what this does, this breaks it down. This breaks salvation down across the Bible from Adam to the, you know, Revelation 22. When it comes to salvation, what is different? What is the same and what is different? Um, and as soon as you start saying something's different, people say, oh, it's heresy, it's heresy. So I tried to break down into different domains of thought to consider what is the same and what is different. It actually started with the four, the four A's of salvation, and then over time it grew. And you know, you're allowed when you have your own ideas, you're allowed to do that. You can grow your ideas, and turn it turned into eight A's of salvation eventually. So go watch that playlist when you get a chance. And accessories is the one that we're talking is is where regeneration, being born again, is a is an accessory of salvation during this era. But it, there's no reason to believe that it was an accessory of salvation during previous era. They had different accessories than we do. So a Calvinist, once you point out that there is no Old Testament regeneration, a Calvinist response will say, um, they, first of all, they will hope that you don't realize the problem. And then they will work the Rubik's Cube backwards to try to reverse engineer regeneration back into the Old Testament. Another thing they will do is they will try to shift the burden of proof acting as if regeneration of the Old Testament should be considered default until proven wrong. They'll try to shift the burden of proof. Like, no, if you want to put regeneration in the Old Testament, it's your job to put it there. I don't add anything to my slate, my body of knowledge until I see it in Scripture. I don't see any regeneration in the Old Testament. It's based, this is based, the fact that they do this, is based on eisegesis, which is the opposite of the inductive method, in which case nothing is assumed or affirmed until it is specified in the text. So we wait for things to be specified in the text until we add it to our body of knowledge. There is no text that ever says regeneration is occurring prior to Acts 2. Okay? So uh, you want to watch out for those. By the way, a lot of the slides you're going to see are also in this video that we talked about a few minutes ago. Okay? So I'm not going to rework the wheel, but I bring this information in. Nothing wrong with hitting some of the same stuff afresh. When it comes to this kind of stuff, using the inductive method, the biblical interpretation model, the user makes no assumptions. He only affirms what is specified in the text. Where assumptions are required, they are labeled as assumptions, and all conclusions in which the assumptions was employed <laughs> were employed are held suspect until the assumption can be validated or invalidated. We observe three steps. We observe, interpret, apply. If regeneration is not observed to be specified in the text, then there is no reason to assume its presence. Systematic doctrinal necessity of something to be occurring is not a valid reason to assume that it was. In other words, because of Calvinism's systematic theology... They need regeneration in the Old Testament because their system falls apart without it. The fact that it's a necessity of that model, it doesn't mean that it's a valid reason to put regeneration there. It just means the model's wrong. That's all it means. So rather, lack of the specified occurrence, in other words, there is no regeneration mentioned in the Old Testament, is a valid reason to assume that the systematic doctrine and its requirements are flawed and should be scrapped. So you get rid of them. Calvinist has a doctrinal requirement for regeneration to occur in the Old Testament. Systematic theology reason. You know, they're, Calvinists don't follow scripture. They don't believe the Bible. They follow stuff like this and they think that it's the Bible. They, well, they think that the stuff in here is scriptural. And they'll say phrases like the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach anything. The Bible says things. Okay. And whether or not it's teaching something is another matter entirely. The Bible believer has no such doctrinal requirement. We are free to believe what the Bible says, and we're free to not have to believe what the Bible does not say. It's that easy. The burden of proof is on the Calvinist to show the presence of regeneration when and where their system needs it to occur in order for their system to be consistent. I don't need to prove or invalidate the consistency of their system. 
their system is not valid. It's assumed to be invalid until they prove otherwise. I don't need their system. Okay, nobody needs their system. Somebody asked me recently to debate, and they uh, Calvinist wants me to debate. I said sure, and they're like, "What what topics are you interested in?" And one and I listed several. And one of them is why why do we need Calvinism? Why do we need <laughs> what? Does it benefit the Christian to add Calvinism to base Christianity? What's the benefit there? Why do that? What does Calvinism bring to the table that base Christianity doesn't already have? Okay? <laughs> I, we, don't need, we don't need that kind of nonsense. The Bible believer needs to stick to the observation facts and on this point and not back down. So understand logic when you go into this if you start having a discussion with somebody about this. Because people, they have... See, they have these presuppositions built in, and what you don't understand, you are you may be thinking, well, I'm just trying to find the facts. Either regeneration is in the Old Testament or it's not, right? And I don't care either way, I just want to know, right? Well, they need it to be there, and so they become emotionally attached to it. They have attachment, and then they become identified with it. And then, if you disagree with them on that, it's not a matter of fact finding for them. You are immoral. You lack virtue. You are some kind of heretic or David Cloresh or something like that because you don't believe in regeneration in the Old Testament. And then they're going to start trying to, can you find anybody in church history who agrees with all this kind of nonsense? Okay, because they are, they are attached to in group belonging, in group ranking. That they, they have no idea that they're viewpoint is has zero epistemic warrant in it zero it's all it's all these other things that influence why people believe the things that they believe in the old testament there are differences in the way the holy spirit operated in first samuel sixteen fourteen, but the spirit of the lord departed from saul and an evil spirit from the lord troubled him well in the new testament we're sealed by the spirit till the day of redemption we have the indwelling spirit, as the questioner said, and that uh, spirit that dwells in you, there's, no, there's nothing that says it goes away. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed in the day of redemption. So you can, you can grieve the Holy Spirit of God, but you're still sealed in the day of redemption in the New Testament. Saul, in the Old Testament, was not a beneficiary of that situation. The situation is very different. And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. Okay, so this "I will never leave you nor forsake you" stuff, eh? Not, not so for everyone at all times. First Samuel twenty-eight fifteen, and Samuel said to Saul, "Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up?" And Saul answered, "I am sore distressed for the Philistines make war against me, and God is departed from me, and answered me and answereth me no more." So there was a time when God was answering. And was with Saul, and then, then there's a time when he departed from him. Psalm fifty one eleven. Cast me David's praying, cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Why is he praying that? Because he didn't have a New Testament, there was no Pentecost, there was no indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and just like what happened to Saul, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, when David is in Psalm fifty one. He has just committed adultery and murder, okay? And he is saying, I don't want to wind up like Saul. Please don't take your Holy Spirit from me like you did to Saul. And then some people try to use this to prove that you can lose your salvation in the, in the New Testament. Well, maybe you can lose your salvation in the New Testament, but this is not a good reason for it, okay? Because this situation, the fact that the Holy Spirit can be taken from somebody is not the situation that we are in. It's a situation that he was in. So don't narcissistically, uh, anachronistically uh, take things out of the context in which they're found. Numbers 24, 2, And Balaam lifted up his eyes, and he saw Israel abiding in his tense corner of their spirit, and the Spirit of God came upon him. So the Spirit of God comes on Balaam, but if you look in Second Peter chapter 2, we find that Balaam, and in Revelation 2 and 3, Balaam is hell-bound. Balaam goes to hell. But the Spirit of God came upon him. So there's in the Old Testament, during that time frame, there is not any kind of permanence or sealing or anything like that with the way the Holy Spirit operated. Holy Spirit's there. Holy Spirit is, you know, arguably omnipresent. You know, all this, whatever you want to say. And we're not here to argue that. The point is that 
the function of the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit is doing, change. God doesn't change. Well, you need to read your Bible because the function changed. And you need to reconcile that on your own. When the Bible says, I am the Lord thy God, I change not. That's all you hear from a Calvinist sometimes. But then the context is, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. What he's saying is that I don't change my mind about whether or not the sons of Jacob are God's chosen people. And that's in Malachi. Because in Exodus 32, he was trying to change his mind on it. He was. And uh, Moses had to talk him out of it. So you better <laughs> watch how you just quote things. Don't don't be quoting things out of context. And I know if there's any Calvinists listening to this, they're they're yelling and fussing at the screen right now, and they're basically yelling, hurling things against me like I'm somehow immoral for believing what the Bible says over how they present the attributes of God. Well, that's their problem, not mine. I'm just a guy who thinks the Bible's true. That's it. That's all. That's all there is to it. Regeneration only occurs twice in Scripture as a word. Matthew 20, 19, 28. Verily I say unto you that you which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Well, this kind of stuff doesn't come up to like after Revelation 20. Okay, So this is a future thing. Either the millennial reign, new heavens, new earth, that kind of thing is the regeneration that's being talked about here. It is not, it is the regeneration of like new heavens, new earth regeneration, not a regeneration of individuals spiritually. Okay. So that if you were to make a doctrine out of regeneration and put it there, you would be very wrong for doing so. Okay. So you always want to, context is king all the time. Titus 3, 5 is the other place, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. It's Titus, and Titus is a Gentile. He is a Gentile pastor under Paul, the apostle. So saved us would include a Gentile, so he's not talking about Jews here necessarily, or, you know, exclusively or anything like that. Saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Well, we also know that God saves those that believe, 1 Corinthians one twenty one. Well, how does he do that? By the washing of regeneration, which he does, and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he does to those that believe, 1 Corinthians one twenty one. So belief is a prerequisite to God doing this to save a person. So God is the person who does the saving. He does 100% of the saving, but he only does it for those that believe. It's that simple. And this is, this is that by which people are saved. You can ask the question, what saves? And you're going to get a moralistic response. It's not what saves, it's who saves. Yeah, but just don't do that, okay? <laughs> what does the who do? Does that sound like Dr. Seuss now? In order to save. Well, Jesus saves. How does he do it? We shall be saved by his life, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. The atonement is not what saves. This is what saves. Black ink on white paper. This is what saves. And another Calvinist presupposition that needs to be debunked, that you need to get out of your mind, is that the atonement saves. It doesn't save anybody. It's a necessary precondition for salvation to occur, but it, it was never intended to save. There's no passage of scripture that says it saves. It is necessary to eradicate sin so that a person can be saved, can be glorified later as, as well also. So the washing, regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost. And then if you listen to our talk earlier this week, I think on Tuesday with Larry, uh, maybe there's a whole new way to look at this verse as well. Okay. So is this regeneration the same thing as being born again? Same thing as being born of God? Most of the time in fundamentalist evangelical Christianity, they will be spoken about as if they are the same. But, and I'm not saying they're not, I'm just saying that recognize that that is an assumption that needs to be validated. So the regeneration of Titus 3.5 is, is believed to also be the new birth. And I like to put passages like this. This was that true light. John the Baptist was pointing toward Jesus Christ, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He came to his own, but his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them to believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. 
So when I say this, I'm not saying that you should agree with that, but what I'm saying is that most of the time in evangelical fundamentalist Christianity, the new birth of these passages, being born again and being born of God and regeneration are typically all considered the same thing. I do not advocate that you presume that to be true and march forward. I say that you should mark it down as an assumption that needs to be validated and march forward from there. Maybe it's the same thing. Maybe it's not the same thing. Now, there's an often cited text by Calvinists when trying to prove total depravity and trying to prove regeneration. And the thing that they miss when they go to Ezekiel 36 is that this passage shows that if, if this is talking about regeneration, it doesn't use the phrasing of regeneration, but whatever it's talking about is future tense, like in the millennium, proving that it did not occur in present tense at the time this was spoken. What, that, what does that mean? When, is he, when this was spoken, if this, is re, if this is being born again, John 3, Nicodemus, a new heart will I also give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I will take the stony. Okay, if that's true, what is all that? That's future tense. What does that mean? It wasn't happening then. That's what that means. Okay? And this doesn't happen till later, like Psalm 110 later, the second advent later. <laughs> and this passage refutes replacement theology and supersessionism. Biological Israel, Hebrew Israel, will repossess the literal physical land originally given to their fathers. And that's what this passage is about. Ezekiel 36, 24 to 28 for all. So if you, if when, when Jesus says, are you a master in Israel and you don't know these things, a Calvinist will typically go to Ezekiel 36 and say, look, that's where regeneration is. And these are the things that need to be pointed out to them. Number one, most Calvinists, not all, believe in replacement theology, what they like to call it supersessionism. They believe that the church has replaced Israel and all the promises to Israel now pertain to the church and Israel is gone. No more thing. All right. Now that comes from the antisemitism of Catholicism and the Protestants. So Catholics, Calvin, Luther, all very strict anti-Semites. And that carries over into the Calvinists today with their replacement theology. Okay. Well, the truth is um, Zionism, essentially, <laughs> it is coming back to Jerusalem. It's coming back to Israel. I will take from you, you from among the heathen. Okay, what does that mean? From among the heathen. He's not talking about Gentiles. The heathen are the Gentiles there. He's not talking about Gentiles getting saved. He's talking about Israel physically being taken out of places like Germany and Poland and Russia, etc. I will gather you out of all countries. Where are Christians? We're in all countries. We're not being gathered out into us. And I will bring you to your own land. Christians don't, we don't have our own land. We exist everywhere. My, you know, I'm in Baton Rouge, Louisiana right now. I don't have a biblically promised own land. This goes all the way back to Genesis 12 and 15 and 18. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, that specific plot of land. That's what that's talking about. And this is future tense. Now, when did this happen? They didn't come back to their own land till 1948. They got, spring, they got taken out of their land around 70 AD. They didn't come back to their land until 1948. So this, so far, based on what we know, this cannot have happened until at least 1948. Now, there's some other things that need to happen. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. Sprinkle. Not submerge. That's different. It's, that's, don't think that's baptism. This is like stuff that would be sprinkled and ceremonial stuff. Not being dipped in the mikvah, in the running water. And you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from your idols. I will cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you. Ezekiel twenty thirty five, Revelation 12. And a new spirit will I put within you. Well, that hasn't happened to Israel yet. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I'll give you a heart of flesh. Now, what Calvinists do, context and Calvinism never go together. And they will always take this out of context. And they think that this is happening to the individual Gentile in America today. Okay? And... You know, I know a lot of you listening aren't in America, but <laughs> Calvinists, they're so narcissistic. They're so, they're so narcissistic. They, they execute a narcissist from their narcissism, and they think this is about them. This has, if, this has absolutely nothing to do with you, if you're listening to this, unless you are an Israelite. It's Israel. It's about Israel. And I will put my spirit within you. 
and I will cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Well, that rules out Calvinists right there. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. Where is the Calvinist on this? You see how this doesn't make any sense? And, I, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. This is a national thing. This is associated with the land. Okay? So context always refutes Calvinism. This is not the new birth that the individual, except a man be born again, he cannot save the kingdom of God. This is not the new birth that uh, Jesus was talking about in John chapter 3. Okay? This is a national thing that will happen to Israel. To Israel. In the future, coming soon to a city near you. Now, the passage may be something like this. Psalm 22, 30, right after, by the way, Psalm 22 is all about the crucifixion of Christ. As a prophecy, too. Uh, what Nicodemus probably should have known about is that a seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. Okay? Not a gen like when we think of generation, we think like is a generation 20 years or 40 years, that kind of thing. Not that kind of generation, but something that is generated. Like a when you think of a plant sprouting, that plant is being generated. Okay. Like power generation, life generation, that kind of generation. They shall come and declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born. That he hath done this. Okay. Calvinists don't know this verse they don't understand this verse and it might be a wise tactic not to show this card immediately because especially if you're in a rivalrous scenario and you need to game a a little bit uh for the sake of what you know third party listeners or there's family or church problems um if it, if you're in a rivalrous scenario prolonging their ignorance sometimes is what can work to your advantage for the situation so i'll let you exercise your own wisdom on that so i would press them on what nicodemus should have known let them produce Ezekiel 36 as what they think Jesus was talking about. Show them what's wrong with Ezekiel 36. Then get them into a position where they have to ask you what Jesus was talking about. They don't know. And they will not find healing until they have to stare that fact in the face a few times. So make sure that you drive it home. Now I want to give you some narrative examples. Luke 22, 32. Um, <laughs> Now, maybe my view on this might change after talking to Larry on Tuesday, but why is Jesus telling Peter when thou art converted if he's already regenerated? Okay? This would be following the view that Peter defected when he rejected Christ three times. John seven thirty nine. but this spake he of the Spirit, we already covered this verse. Which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water when you believe on Jesus, and it does not take effect till after the Holy Spirit is given. John fourteen seven, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth what? With you, present tense, and shall be in you. A lot of people make a big distinction out of the with and the in there. Kind of like Old Testament type versus New Testament type of functioning of the Holy Spirit. And I'm, I'm not trying to say these things dogmatically. I'm just pointing them out. Acts 1, 4 through 5, before Pentecost actually happens, and being assembled together with them, commanded them they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So that Holy Ghost baptism, being dwelled with the power from on high, is the same promise that he points out in Luke twenty four forty nine. I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And then you go to Acts 1, 8, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in both Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. So that promise of the Power from on high, Luke twenty four forty nine. Same author, Luke, 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 in the book of Acts. Acts could be called, you know, Luke two for all intents and purposes. It's the same author, and so he's referring to the same promise, and it comes with power, and the Holy Ghost is come upon you. So it sounds like maybe baptized with the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost come upon you. Maybe those phrases are interchangeable, and that starts at Acts two is when that comes. Now, remember these, because I'm going to refer to them later, all right? 
but whatever was happening with the Holy Ghost at that point was not happening before that point, at least not programmatically. Acts 2, 8 through 10. And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers, Mesopotamia, and Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya about Syrian and strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes. Now think about this. Who are these guys? Jews and proselytes. What are they doing? They're at the temple. Why? Because Deuteronomy 16.16 16 tells them to present themselves to the temple three times a year. They have to. And so there they are. They're obeying the law. And then Peter says to these Jews, they're Jews and proselytes, no Gentiles there yet. He says to these Jews, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, if you are being regenerated in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant, under the Mosaic Law, these guys are Jews. They're already following the law. Why aren't they regenerated? Why do they need to be baptized to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost? You see? Did the Holy Ghost leave them? Did they get regenerated, then lose it? If you're being regenerated in the Old Testament, everybody Jesus showed up talking to would be regenerated because they're law-abiding, pork-abstaining, Sabbath-observing, circumcised, temple-worshipping Jews. Okay? Why aren't they regenerated? So if you were regenerated in the Old Testament then most of the people Jesus showed up talking to, they're already doing all the things in the covenant that should result in being regenerated. Well, guess what? They're not. <laughs> so that's the easiest, to me, that's the easiest proof right there that nobody in the Old Testament is being regenerated because the people who were, who were under the Old co Covenant were not regenerated and did not have the Holy Ghost. Okay? Um. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Before that, they're going preaching to Jews only. Well, why are they, pre why are they bothering preaching to Jews if they're already Jews, they're already saved under the Old Covenant, they would already be regenerated? Why do you need to preach to Jews if they're already regenerated? Right? Old Testament? So they're, they're not. The reason they're preaching to Jews is because they're not regenerated, because nobody's being regenerated until they trust in Christ. And the Holy, and the Holy Spirit comes after Acts 2. Nobody's being regenerated until then. Um, Acts 19, 1 through 7. Paul's coming down to the upper coast to Ephesus, and he found certain disciples. And he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? I said unto him, well, we were under the Old Covenant, so in, in the Old Covenant, we get the Holy Ghost to be regenerated, uh, which has been happening since Abraham, so of course we have the Holy Ghost. No, that's not what they said. We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? Unto John's baptism. These are people, these are good guys, following the law. They're Jews. They're following the Old Testament law. They're even following John's baptism. No regeneration. No regeneration, no Holy Ghost, did not receive the Holy Ghost. We were baptism with the bat so they go on, then they had to be baptized again, and they get the hands laid on them, get the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost came on them. So, you know, pr presumably they're regenerated then. Why weren't they regenerated before? Because in the Old Covenant, nobody's being regenerated, that's why. Hebrews 9, 15 through 17, it's, uh, there's no testament the testament is not of force and uh it, the testament is of force until men are dead otherwise it's of no strength at all while the testator liveth for where a testator is there must also of necessity be the death of the testator okay so while jesus christ is still alive everybody is still under the old covenant so if that being the case Everybody that John the Baptist and Jesus are preaching to would already be regenerated because all their their own the ministry was only to Jews. Look at John ten five through six. He tells his apostles, "Go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Don't go to the Samaritans. Don't go to the Gentiles. Just go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel." Why would you do that if they're already regenerated? Well, because they're not regenerated. That's why. Because you're not regenerated in the Old Testament. Philip, uh, Philippians 3, 4 through 6, you look at all this stuff Paul was. Paul was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews, is touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. 
This dude is following the law to a T, doing all the things you got to do in the Old Testament. Um, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, all the things. Got all the things. Not regenerated. Why? Because you're not regenerated under the Old Covenant. Old Covenant does not bring regeneration. So some bullet points that I pointed out. This was actually the summary. This slide was the same thing as the summary that was in this video, but it is worth bearing out here for the sake of giving something to think about. The Calvinist system failed to identify key assumptions in its axiomatic formulation. They axiomatically assume that regeneration happens in the Old Testament. There's no reason to believe that it does. The Calvinist insistence of regeneration in the Old Testament is purely an eisegetical requirement of their system. It is not organic to any sound interpretive methodology. In other words, if you're following the inductive method, you will never come up with regeneration happening in the Old Testament. You have to be trying to synthesize something based on bad axioms in order to come up with that kind of nonsense. There's no regeneration occurring in the Old Testament. It's a phenomenon strictly from Pentecost forward. As far as I can observe, I have no reason to put it before Pentecost, okay? Uh, for the reasons that I've already showed. Prophecies of regeneration in the Old Testament, Ezekiel 36, are future tense showing... If, now, I should put this in quotes because that is not necessarily even regeneration. But prophecies of what people say is regeneration in the Old Testament are future tense showing that it is not... Uh, occurring at the time, and the passages also refute p replacement theology. Okay, um, New Testament. The New Testament clearly states the giving of the Holy Spirit as a definite event on the timeline that occurred at Pentecost. You could look at a timeline, something like this. Holy Spirit, Pentecost, and I have this little bird here that represents the, the Holy Spirit. It definitely occurs at a specific time. Okay, At Pentecost. Um, narratives of characters in the book of Acts demonstrate that regeneration was definitely not occurring under the Old Covenant. So if it was happening in the Old Testament, it should be happening under the Old Covenant, and it was not, okay? Because those people were not born again. And why would Jesus speak in parables to a bunch of religious people who were, who were under the Old Covenant so that they wouldn't be healed and forgiven? Well, shouldn't they be healed and forgiven? You know, all that. So think about it. Think. Think about this kind of stuff, Christians. So in the question, somebody says, is children of God and born of God synonymous here? <laughs> and I would, I would further ask, this is me talking here, not their question, or is it a mistake to make a doctrine out of the concept of being born again or regenerated, or should we treat each mentioning, each occurrence, separately? I'm going to say occurrence here. Separately. And use the inductive method for the phrasing and the context in which it appears. This is what I'm leaning toward here. Treat, don't make a doctrine out of a word or a phrase and then import that doctrine every time that word or phrase shows up. Context is king. So we're going to use the inductive method to interpret every verse separately. And it could be. It could be that when these people use the phrase like begotten us again. Or born again, it could be that they're using this symbolic language in a unique way in this context, and that they're not referring to any kind of overarching doctrine that we have systematized and harmonized. Because remember, the Bible was not written as inputs for systematic theology. The Bible was written, the passages are written to convey whatever this writer is trying to tell us. And that's what you have to ask. That's what you have to try to figure out. What is this writer trying to tell me? And he's using this either as a metaphor or figurative language or as a literal. He's using this language to tell me something. What's he trying to tell me? And it, and it may not have anything to do with some kind of overarching doctrine associated with these words. You have to remember, put yourself in the mind, in the mind of Peter. And these, they did not have a systematic theology that they were having to be in obeisance to. Okay? They're just trying to talk and communicate a point. And oftentimes we do this today. We might use a figure of speech to say one thing over here and then use a figure of speech to say something else over here. Something completely different. Okay? I think in one of the Rocky movies, I think Apollo Creed says, I feel like I've been born again. And he's not saying this religious evangelical kind of phrase. What he's saying is he, 
He feels like he's in really good shape. He's got a lot of energy. All, all this kind of thing is what he means by that. And in the context, that's that's it's obvious that's what he means. You know, got a new start at life is kind of what he's saying. <laughs> I won't spoil how that goes, by the way. If you haven't seen that. But it's obvious that he he's not talking about some kind of you know, invent things. It feels like he's got like a new, new fresh start on life kind of thing. So I would, I would encourage people to look at the phrases afresh in the context in which they appear like that every time. First Peter 1, 3, when Peter, what is Peter? He's the apostle to who? He's the apostle to the circumcision, to Israel, not to the Gentiles. Not that he can't minister to Gentiles because he does, but his directionality of this ministry is pointed primarily at Israel. Galatians chapter 2, uh, Acts 15. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, is, is this begotten us again some kind of doctrinal thing about being born again or some kind of regeneration of individuals? Or could it be that since he's talking to Jews, the fact that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and rose from the dead kind of gave them a fresh start as Israel. Maybe that's what he's talking about. Remember, he's just trying to make, what, what point is he trying to make here? Stop trying to think that everything has to fit into a systematic theology and has to be harmonized with all these kind of doctrinal things. Could just be, hey, we're Israel. We, we, now, we have a fresh start and a new life with Jesus Christ, the fact that he rose from the dead. Doesn't have to be a doctrine. It does, doesn't have to be a doctrine associated with anything you read necessarily. In the Bible, especially especially a propositional conclusion based doctrine, especially that being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. <clears throat> is this born again the exact same thing that Jesus is talking about over in John chapter one? Or could this be, you know, just the concept of, you know, he doesn't say, uh, Born of God, regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit. When we think of born again and regeneration, we tend to think of the Spirit. That which is flesh is flesh. That which is spirit is spirit. Jesus says you must be born of the Spirit. Well, there's no mention of the Spirit here. Is this born again is by the Word of God. Incorruptible seed, Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. No mention of the Spirit. Sounds different to me. So maybe again, this is just a prompting that, hey, we have a new shot at life now, a new fresh perspective, a new start. Maybe it's just a metaphor to signify that. Maybe. but it, Maybe we should start seeing things that way instead of trying to import a doctrine of being born again into these things. James 1.18, of his own will, who's James written to? James is definitely written to the 12 tribes. And I'll have to show that because there's something about seeing the text that when I just say it, people don't believe it. I don't know what it is, but in James 1, James, a servant of God, is this, yeah, and of the Lord Jesus Christ to what? To the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. James is not writing to Gentiles. He's writing to the 12 tribes. Definitely writing to the 12 tribes. And what's he say? Of his own will begat he us with the Spirit of God, because that which is born of spirit is spirit? No. This is more like what Peter says. Of the word of truth, not spirit, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creature. So per, instead of this like begat he us with the word of truth, you know, a lot of people say that's, you know, they try to tie that to regeneration and individual becoming a Christian and getting everlasting life, that sort of thing. Well, maybe he's not saying that at all. Maybe he's saying, you know, Israel, we have, of of God's own will, he begat us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Maybe it's going back all the way to the choosing. He's talking to the 12 tribes. He's going back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the fact that the promise was promised to Abraham, you know, Genesis 12, 15, and 18, that kind of stuff. Or maybe it's this fresh start because of Jesus when he talks about saving the soul, uh, that's received with meekness, the engrafted word, which is able to save the soul in verse 21. So maybe again, 
This is not talking about some kind of doctrinal punctiliar thing that necessarily happens to individuals when they convert to Christianity, but something else. So it could be a metaphorical language pointing to the fact that the nation of Israel has been granted another chance or new life through Jesus having a plan B, even though Israel rejected and crucified their Messiah. It's kind of an example of what James could be talking about here, rather than some kind of doctrinal thing that we have imported into it. Now we're going to talk about Abraham and David, and then we're going to quit. What about Abraham? Well, in Abraham 15, 5 through 7, and he brought forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven. God's telling Abraham, If thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall I see thee. He talked to the stars. Uh, about the stars. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Now, this gets used later in Romans chapter 4. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And that's that same land that shows back up in Ezekiel 36. So Paul refers to Abraham, what shall we say then that our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found for Abraham, if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. And we have all these doctrines about justification and imputed righteousness and that sort of thing. And it says it's counted to him for righteousness, that he believed God. Now, Abraham was what? He's not under the law. So whether or not something applies to Abraham, you have to understand that he is a special case and it's not necessarily that way under the Mosaic law because things change under the Mosaic law. There's more information, there's more revelation, there's more light. We call this the, the time of promise because all basically all you have here is the promise that God gave to Abraham with regard to what? The seed? And the land. That's what that's what the promise includes. And so Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. So we need to understand that Abraham... Does, um, does this mean he was saved? Um, you know, it doesn't... The Bible doesn't speak in that kind of terminology. The Old Testament is not overly concerned. There are a few places. Like in Job 19, Psalm 17. And I'm... You know, there are a few places that... that allude to the afterlife, that kind of thing. But the Old Testament is not focused on everlasting life in the afterlife like we tend to think of seeing more often in the New Testament. It's just not there. <laughs> and Abraham was not under the law. So bear that in mind. Um, we already talked about these, but I would say that... It, does it, so does does Abraham need to be regenerated in order to be considered righteous? No. In Calvinism, he would be, but not in the Bible. Okay, So Calvinism, well, well, you can't have any kind of thing that Paul equates to justification without regeneration. Well, why not? Why not? <laughs> why not? So that's, that comes from, that's a theological objection of theirs. It's not a biblical objection of theirs. So there's no problem with Abraham being counted righteous without being regenerated. Now these old things where Jesus is promising the spirit to come, we already covered these passages. And then over here in John 12, John 20, he says, uh, receive ye the Holy Ghost. He's talking to his apostles and he says, receive ye the Holy Ghost. This is before Pentecost. Now there's several theories on this, but one of the theories that the one that I like the best is basically that he's, um, it's going to be a while until Pentecost happens here. And he's basically giving the apostles, the Holy Ghost in an old Testament sense, like the way Saul got it and it departed from that kind giving it to him in an old Testament sense until Pentecost hits, which makes sense to me. But, the fact is that he's saying this. If he says, receive, the Holy, receive ye the Holy Ghost, there are already Jews who were under the Old Covenant. Why would they need to receive the Holy Ghost if they're already regenerated? You see, they wouldn't. So it's not happening in the Old Testament. And maybe I should have said that. Maybe I had these slides out of order. But anyway, back to Abraham. So if you look at where Abraham is on the timeline, Abraham shows up right about here. Well, Abraham is not under the law. You need to understand when you say, when people say Old Testament, they think the law. So if you're looking at your Bible, 
All right? A lot. Um, let me go to let me go to the book of Matthew here. <laughs> So if you look at the Old Testament in your Bible, a lot of that Old Testament, the, the bulk of the material happens basically right here. The bulk of the material happens here in this time frame. But the bulk of the time, and that, that's, you know, 1500 years, Moses is about 1500 years before Christ. And there's a 400 year gap so you get about 1100 years worth of stuff basically the bulk of the old testament well the bulk of time does not occur under moses the bulk of time happens back here 2500 years about 2500 years happens back there so i put this little box there to show you that the bulk of time in the old testament so adam up through abraham isaac jacob 12 tribes, all this kind of stuff happens, and then eventually Moses. So the book of Genesis, essentially. And you'd put Job back there, too. Job happens probably about the same time um, Jacob and Esau, contemporaries with them. So Job and Genesis are happening during this time frame, and there's, you know, it's only two books of the Bible, but that's the bulk of the time. So you have to remember all those people, they're not under the law either. The closest thing we have to it, it seems like Noah is taking un or certain animals on board the ark to sacrifice them. So there's some kind of information like that, but there's we don't have a Mosaic law yet. So whatever was true under the Mosaic law is not necessarily true for somebody before it or somebody after it. So bear that in mind as well. But there's also no reason to believe that anybody during this whole time period before Pentecost is being regenerated for any reason. So what happened to Abraham? So Abraham ostensibly um, goes down into Abraham's bosom. And we covered this in one of our recent videos. This is a chart from Peter Ruckman. And, you know, I'm not trying... As soon as you mention a name like that, people say, Oh, you're believing everything Ruckman says. And you're an idiot if you say that, okay? So no, we, we uh, separate the signal from the noise with everybody, including you, including John Piper and uh, the President of the United States. And everything. We always separating the signal from the noise. But he demonstrates kind of what's described. This drawing kind of illustrates what's described in the New Testament as Abraham's bosom, where you have a place of paradise over here, and then you have um, the the spirits in prison over here. Okay, and and the idea is that when Jesus comes down, he comes down and preaches to the spirits that are in prison, and then when he comes up. You know, he leads captivity captive, is what the Bible says, which may be, which could mean that all the people who are in paradise, that's also down here, they go up with him back up into heaven. So then now they believe, counted them for righteousness, there's no need to be regenerated because they're being delivered right then. So then they go up to the third heaven with Christ when he goes up with his resurrection. And also you have a bunch of people... We don't know what happened to them. In Matthew 27, a lot of the graves of the saints which slept, those people arose and went into the holy city and testified unto the people. What happened to them? Maybe, <laughs> but that happened after the resurrection, even though we're told about it before the resurrection. So maybe they went, maybe they ascended, maybe they stayed and then ascended when Jesus did. So uh, maybe some of them went with Jesus when he rose from the dead. Maybe some of them rose Matthew 27 after the resurrection and went up with him when he ascended. Okay. But the idea is now that that's empty. There is a theory that in the tribulation period, it might be re getting repopulated for a reason, which we're not going to get into here. Um, but what about Abraham? So he would be down there and would be delivered in one of those uh, iterations right there. So Christ also hath once suffered first Peter three eighteen through 19 for the sins for the, the just for the unjust. By the way, that's uh, you can use that with regard to limited atonement as well. If you are unjust, Christ suffered for your sins. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also, by what? By the Spirit. Made alive by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So then specifically, if these guys are down here in prison, if you will, they get preached to and maybe they resurrect with Christ or ascend with him, something like that. I don't know. Something to think about. 
What about David? Well, the Holy Spirit did not operate in the Old Testament the same way as he does in the New Testament. So when you have this over here, um, these are all we already covered these passages showing that the Holy Spirit does not work the same way in the Old Testament as he does in the New, right? And then when David prays, uh, cast me not away from thy presence, take not thy Holy Spirit from me, people who want to refute eternal security use this to prove it, and then people who want to uh, <laughs> justify it, they use this, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. See, David didn't lose his salvation, he just one of the joy of it restored. So look, both those arguments are stupid because if whatever the Holy Spirit is doing in the New Testament after Pentecost was not happening at that time anyway, it wasn't happening. There's no eternal security. Whether you believe in it or not, it was not happening during the time of David. Now, David might have particular mercies associated with him because Isaiah 53 Incline your ear and come unto me and hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. David had it. David was not just a rank and file person in the Old Testament. And the reason I say that is because God made a covenant with him and made a promise to him. And <laughs> this is referred to as the sure mercies of David. So when Paul is using David and Abraham in Romans 4. He is not telling you that this is how it happened for everybody all the time, everywhere, rank and file people in the Old Testament. What he's giving you is two proofs of concept that if God wants to offer sure mercies, he sure can because he did it with David. And if he wants to justify people by faith, he sure can because he did it with Abraham. Two proofs of concept is what he's using. He's not trying to tell you how it was for everybody all the time back then. He's giving you two proofs of concept to show that what we have now is something that God can do. And here's two precedences for it in the past. That's what's going on there. So when David says, for thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. Psalm 51, same prayer. What has he just done? He has just committed adultery and murder. And he says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken contrite heart. O God, thou will not despise. I've heard, I listened to a lady teach on this, you know, a couple months ago. And she used this verse to try, she has this argument that the sacrifices were never intended at all in the first place. And that was some kind of provisional acquiescence because of the heart of man, something like that. Well, whether or not that's the case... That's not what this verse is about. When David says, thou desirest not sacrifice, he's not making a blanket statement about God never ever desiring sacrifice for any reason. What was his problem? His problem was adultery and murder. Okay, what happens in the Old Testament if you commit adultery? The man that commits adultery with another woman's wife, even he that committed adultery, that's exactly what David did with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. You know a lot of other sins, what happens in the Old Testament? It'll say, if you do XYZ sin, you need to sacrifice a lamb or take two turtle doves and 20 pieces of silver. There's all kinds of things to do to atone for or amend for certain sins in the, in the Mosaic Law. There is nothing to amend for adultery in the Mosaic Law. It is death. That's why he says, thou desires not sacrifice. What if you murder somebody? Numbers 35-31. That was Leviticus 20.10, by the way, for those who are only listening to the audio. Numbers 35.31, Moreover, ye shall take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer, which is guilty of death, but he shall be surely put to death. There's nothing, you can't go to the temple and absolve murder. You get put to death. So there's no sacrifice for that. So that's, so, so what does David have? David has an everlasting covenant. He has sure mercies of David. So even though he committed adultery and murder, which are very bad and which cost his family dearly, he was not put to death and he was not removed from the covenant. That is not normal. David was being treated very abnormally. Most people, rank and file people under the Mosaic law, commit adultery, commit murder, they get put to death. Not David. David's a special case. David's also a special case because uh, in the same passage, I was conceived in sin. This might be interesting to bring up here just briefly. 
speaking of David, if you look in Deuteronomy chapter 23, David was conceived in sin. Um, and I might bring over here Psalm 51.4. Now, we've talked about this on the channel before. Oh, I hate it when I forget to do that. David says in Psalm 51.5, Behold, I was shaken, shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And in Psalm 23.1, it says, A bastard should not enter the congregation of the Lord. That's somebody who's born to unwed parents. Even to his tenth generation shall he not enter the congregation of the Lord. An Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Well, Moabite? Let's see here. You ever heard the story of Ruth? So if you go David, who's David's father, is Jesse. And then David's, uh, Jesse's father is Obed. And Obed's father is Boaz. Well, who did Boaz marry? Ruth, the Moabitess. David has no, <laughs> he has no business being in the congregation of the Lord. And so he was conceived in this sin. He was shaping an iniquity. And there's probably some, there's probably some stigma that goes along with that when Jesse was marrying, uh, you know, <laughs> his wife. And or when the wife was marrying Jesse, when all this stuff was coming down, probably nobody wanted to marry in that line because there was a Moabitess in there. And it could be, you know, read between the lines kind of thing. I'm not saying this is scripture, but it could be that Jesse was an undesirable because he was descended from Ruth and that whatever David's mother was. May Jesse may have been the only option because of something else that she had done. I don't know. I don't know. Just think about how, how a culture might treat somebody like that when you have laws like this that are in place. So we're going to quit here. Remember, our slideshow is available in Etsy, in the, and that's in the description below if you want the slideshow that we talked about today. And we discussed this question about regeneration in the Old Testament and what's it mean for Abraham and are these things synonymous. I don't know if you're satisfied with the answer, but uh, I enjoy looking into it. I hope you did too. I always enjoy thinking about these kinds of things because it helps us to consider the Bible as a whole. It's a good opportunity to use some perspectival knowing and zoom out a little bit like that. And remember, don't forget to get your 12 months off purgatory if you support the channel in the month of December this year. So thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and good day.